Okay. All right, so today I'll be uh, talking about domain-driven design and how it, it enables meaning and productivity in our work with complex IT systems. So first, a little bit about me. I am Xin, and I have become an independent consultant. I have a background in theoretical computer science. Um, yeah, so what I do for a living um, doesn't really fit neatly into any standard road description. I think probably the closest approximation uh, would be an architect, to say I'm an architect. And indeed, like uh, uh, Jakob has just introduced, I have been a, a architect for as long as I can remember. <laughs> People who know me and my work very well would uh, describe me as a boundary spanner, a system thinker, um, a facilitator of conversations, and a change agent. And indeed, I have Danske Bank to thank for for the last 12 years where I could get my hands dirty with uh, the uh, really deep down implementation and uh, play around with domain-driven design in solving some of the wicked problems we have met, and so I, have bec uh, I was the bank's first DDD evangelist, and I've al uh, also been uh, fortunate enough to be the, uh, in the chief architect role, um, leading many cross-domain, cross-system, and uh, uh, cross-team uh, change initiatives. Um, I really enjoy uh, facilitating uh, collaborative modeling and design workshops. Um, so sometimes I also speak at international conferences about my DDD experience, especially lessons learned. Um, last year I spoke about domain driven architecture at DDD Europe. This year I will be um, uh, uh, given a keynote uh, with the title uh, Systems Thinking in Large Scale Modeling. Um, I'm also personally intrigued by you know, uh, larger problems beyond software. And so uh, last year, I uh, shared some of my crazy thinking at Wortley Mapping Map Camp 2022 uh, about what sort of uh, financial systems can support humanity best. So that's a little bit about me. Um, yeah, so as uh, you will hear in this talk, uh, collaborative modeling is one of the core practices in DDD. I really dig it personally, and I groove with it because I think um, this is the place, this is the space where everything else we want to achieve with DDD truly happens. Um, so today my hope is to create a space for you to, first of all, explore the value pro proposition of DDD, having a conversation about the why, why should I care, um, and then I'll also invite you to join a turbo guided tour of key practices in DDD. By way of the first two bullets, I hope to, um, to be able to spark some reflections on how to leverage DDD in your, in your own context. And since I only have, yeah, less than one hour to entertain you, including Q&A, uh, this will be going a little fast, so if you feel that you've been rushed from time to time, then uh, consider it a feature, not a bug. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so DDD has been around for 20 years. Um, it was born in 2003, um, when Eric Evans wrote the book, Domain Driven Design, uh, Tackling Complexity in the Heart of Software. So that was, uh, was uh, what we refer to today as the <coughs> big blue book. It's heavy in all the senses. And 10 years later, Van Vernon wrote another seminal book about DDD, implementing domain-driven design, bringing DDD uh, uh, into a more implementation-based uh, um, popularity. And so, you know, an approach that is 20 years old is like uh, a young man coming of age. Uh, it should have reached a certain level of maturity, right? Um, and that is so if you sort of agree with the assessment uh, of the latest uh, trend report of InfoQ. This is brand new, published in April 2023, so a month ago. 
um, where InfoQ actually put domain-driven design, the adoption of this approach, uh, in the late majority. Um, so, so the way to read this graph is, is, of course, this is they have many trend graphs. This is about architecture and design trends, and an, an architecture and design trend would, you know, first attract some innovators, and then more people would join the game, become early adopters, and then this trend would, um, you know, either uh, uh, proceed and cross the chasm, or just die out and become a fad. And if it crosses the chasm, it will become a early majority and then you know matures into late majority. When something is in late majority, it should feel a little bit like electricity, right? Um, you really don't notice when it's there, but you will notice when it's not there if you have a power outage. So the question is, so that means if you know people are not practicing uh, DDD in uh, designing complex software systems, uh, that would raise some eyebrows, just like if you're not using unit testing for your code. At, at, that's according to InfoQ. But of course, this, this report, this, this uh, trend report is across industries and across you know, company sizes. Um, and we actually have data to evidence that uh, DD, DDD has a lot of success stories in startups, scale ops. In large companies, um, the adoption of DDD has been lagging a, a little bit challenging. Arguably, you know, in large companies, that's where DDD is most needed because that's where the complexity is. Um, and so, so in a way, uh, this uh, uh, William Gibson quote that the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed, is actually quite catchy, except that uh, DDD is a thing from the past, not the future. So um, at this point, I would like to, you know, uh, invite you to do some a little bit, uh, maybe um, personal reflection. Um, what would you, you know, where would you place your organization or your client uh, if you are a, uh, a consultant in terms of its DDD maturity, uh, in terms of knowledge and practice, and why do you think it's hard for large companies to adopt DDD? And so whatever explanations coming into your mind, hold those thoughts and let's carry on to dig a little deeper into DDD and what kind of problems DDD is here to solve. Right, DDD is a three letter acronym. It stands for Domain Driven Design and a more complete and descriptive way of saying it would be business domain-driven socio-technical design. That's a lot. So domain-driven design is also design. And we all have a good intuition that for something to qualify as design, it cannot just contain parts you know, randomly lumped together with the hope that uh, it will work. There's got to be some thoughtfulness behind design. So domain-driven design is also design. That's one thing. So what kind of design then? Since its birth, of course, domain-driven design has had a clear software focus. Now, uh, in 2003, so 20 years ago, when the Big Blue Book was written, the software landscape was way simpler than today. There was uh, you know, no, no microservices, no, no cloud, no AI, no ML, no Docker, no Kubernetes. <laughs> um, Good software design was proudly practiced in monolithic systems. I did some of those too. 20 years forward, fast forward, the uh, software ecosystem has reached such a level of complexity and interconnectedness that we not only need to design those software systems, but we also need to manage the organizational complexity that we have generated around those software. So in a way, if you know Kenevan, we have these um, complicated engineering systems embedded in complex social systems. That's today. So DDD has sort of shifted from having a software-centric focus to a socio-technical focus. So what we're looking at is a, um, so you can say a open ecosystem 
a, a, rather a system of systems. And that system of systems needs design as well. Now, the first part says domain driven, and more correctly, it should be this business domain driven, and that's about design need to have a context, a purpose, and the strategy behind, and the user needs to be met. And so, the DDD approach would emphasize the um, uh, understanding and modeling of the business domain to guide the software design, right? And some of you might be asking, isn't that stating the obvious? Obvious, of course we should do it. But in my observation and experiences, a lot of IT strategies are still far more technology driven than domain driven. And so why do you want to migrate your, your legacy systems to, to the cloud? Oh yeah, because cloud has some cool technology. And by the way, the McKinsey, Re McKinsey report says that it will help us you know, accelerate delivery and save some cost. And why do you want to reorganize using the Spotify model? Oh yeah, you know, uh, it seems to, be, seems to be working for so many startups and scale ups. We really want to deliver software as, as fast as them. Um, and so what uh, DDD actually advocates is to really, the philosophy of DDD is to first take a deeper look at the why, at the problem domain, before we go into technology. So when done right, we would, uh, the ideal situation would be that these two wolves, these the black and the white, the yin and yang of design, would be dancing together in harmony. So then we would be tapping into the fantastic technological opportunities without falling into the trap that we can copy the Spotify model but cannot paste it. We, uh, we um, uh, would formulate a cloud uh, strategy but then put our infrastructure department in charge of the uh, execution and cloud migration roadmap. Um, the latest example I read on LinkedIn yesterday was to use ChatGPT to write your test cases. <laughs> so, 20 years after DDD was born, DDD has been cross-pollinated by uh, a lot of the other thinking tools and design approaches. And the most prominent ones uh, listed here are system thinking, product, product development, team topologies, collaborative design, agile, and strategic modeling such as Wortley mapping. And, and this is really a natural development, right? And it's also explained by uh, uh, Ashby's law, if you know it, of requisite variety. And so it's also called the first law of cybernetics. It, it basically says that, uh, you know, in order to deal properly with the diversity of the problems the world is throwing at us, um, our repertoire of responses need to be at least as nuanced as the problems we are facing. So basically, uh, DDD has got to evolve and adapt in this complex and fast-changing landscape as well to avoid being a monoculture, because monoculture is, is not only bad for natural and biological systems, but also for social systems, um, you know, like a family, like in a team, organization, or even a society. Um, and so uh, when I go out and do DDD work as, as, as a consultant, I try, you know, I, I, and I do not sell DDD or any DDD practice as a silver bullet, for instance, event storming. If I sell anything at all, that would be the philosophy of DDD of always taking a hard and deep look at the problem first before going into the solution mode. So there you go. None of your takeaways from today would be how to use DDD as a silver bullet. Maybe a gold nugget, but not silver bullet. Okay. Going forward to DDD's value proposition, and this is my really biased and opinionated uh, uh, point of view, right? Uh, uh, so not a long time ago, uh, I talked with a CDO, CTO of one of the largest financial providers in Denmark. I kind of asked him, so what is the biggest challenge in your company? 
he looked at me and he shrugged his shoulders and he said, well, too much software. So uh, in the context of really fast changing market and tech, so that's the demand side, right? We have too much software today and we also don't have time to sunset the uh, you know, outdated software, software that is no longer relevant. Uh, we have very little time to um, really uh, pay off our technical debts. And then software problems generate some second order uh, problems such as too many teams, too many meetings, too much information, too many ongoing change efforts, and too many good ideas that uh, coming from consultants, for instance, like DDD demanding our attention. So it's kind of a big mess. So this, here's a way to basically visualize the, the complexity in large change agendas in large companies. So for, for any change agenda to succeed, it has got to have a kind of an alignment among decisions made at all levels, both vertically and horizontally, right? And maybe this picture could give the wrong impression that this could be done in what we all have done in computer science as divide and conquer. Uh, so sorting algorithm, quick sort, right? Uh, or uh, you know, component-based design, one part at a time. Uh, but we then also have an intuition that when we translate this piece to the organizational hierarchy, the links are made in different ways. So after all, complexity is sort of de defined as the presence of multiple um, you know, interconnected and interdependent factors that are in interacting with each other in unpredictable and often nonlinear ways. And so if we are unable to navigate the landscape and we make decisions that are not optimal, we would have some undesired impacts. So why do we make decisions? We want to make decisions to have impact, to impact something. And at how many places can, can, uh, can it go wrong with, with our decisions? Now, if the leadership makes the wrong decision, we pick the wrong direction to go. If the product people make the wrong decision, we build things that don't matter. While the product people could have made the right decision, but if they're not, if they do not succeed in conveying the product idea to the development team, the development team would end up building the wrong things. Maybe what's desired is a bicycle, but they're building a scooter. The, uh, then in the architecture and design realm, it could be that, that the scooter is the right thing to, to design, but uh, some of the you know, non-functional requirements are not stated correctly or are not foreseen, so the scooter can run Maybe can run in Denmark on very flat terrain, but really cannot use, be used in, in Stuttgart, where, where it is very hilly. So this is just to say that decisions can go wrong many places. But this is also weird, right? Because as you know, well-educated uh, professionals in each and every of these ovals, every team could be making the well-meaning decisions based on their best skills and best understanding locally. So each and every of these places would have a local optima. But if these, if these locally optimal decisions do not come together to optimize the whole story, then we would end up having a, something that is not a global uh, optima, right? So that's, that's the situation uh, uh, that is happening in many, many lar large companies and scale-ups. Um, scaling has this, this problem. And, you know, having that big picture and uh, the whole, connecting the whole story is kind of really, really hard. And some people basically, you know, have tried to, especially, I think this, this difficulty is double fold or many fold if you look at the big picture or the whole story from the frog perspective, like you're a developer, you're, you know, an analyst. You look at this place and you say, okay, th this is my backlog, but you know, how does th these thing, things uh, hang together? Some people have made an honest attempt to make sense of the things, but they failed. And other people have basically given up because of the bureaucracy and the organizational politics around it. 
and other people have just basically made up their mind. Uh, it is kind of too big and too complex to fit into my head. I've just ha got to rely on my product uh, owners or product managers to put the right requirements into into the backlog. Um, so what I can what I can do is basically to do my best effort to design that technical solution in my local context. So that's what DDD wants to address is to build a deep alignment between the whole and the parts. So the people behind the design, the people who are in charge of designing the parts have a vivid understanding of the whole and can see how their story fits into the greater vision. So that's, that's alignment. And I think for people working in large companies, it could be a little weird to think that, you know, alignment. We're having alignment meetings all the time. I think if we design a search robot and search through the meeting agendas in the large <laughs> companies, alignment, the word alignment would be one of the top hits. I have invited for a lot of alignment meetings. Um, yeah, so unfortunately what we see is often shallow alignment. What is shallow align alignment that, that is in my, in my mind? You have shallow alignment when the people who are designing the parts, they are not invited to uh, have a conversation about the problem to solve. And the people who are supposed to communicate about the big picture, about the whole, f feel that they are obligated to convince the others um, you know, through abstractions, management abstractions, through a cascade of goals. For people who know the Spotify model, we would say, okay, so our strategic themes uh, break down into uh, initiatives, and then that breaks down into epics, that breaks down into stories. Your, teams, your team is responsible for these epics. Okay, that sounds right. So it's, it's all this kind of uh, abstractions that are being conveyed top down. So usually uh, people are just waiting for the meeting to, to, to end and then the presenter says the magic word, I'm glad we're all aligned, right? So, so, the, uh, <laughs> um, um, so really, so if you don't believe me, just uh, I hope you have a chance to eavesdrop at a town hall or a department meeting in a large company. Um, what is deep alignment? Deep alignment is when you deliberately and consciously invite dissent. So you actually allow people, so the people who are behind the parts and uh, uh, connecting the parts, the time to diverge and allow them to agree to disagree and even encourage them to you know, challenge uh, their own assumptions and challenge the big picture. And so tension and friction are considered as, you know, n not as, uh, challenges and something we should avoid. Let's not embarrass ourselves with tension and friction, but, uh, but as an opportunity to improve our design. So that is sort of uh, the deep alignment. When, when that happens, we have real commitment, right? Real commitment in my mind is, I think unfortunately we often have compliance about decisions instead of commitment. For me, commitment is not just to do what we have agreed to do, but if I could really commit to something, I have the courage to stand up when the conditions around that decision has changed, right? To, to challenge that. And that's, that's real commitment, commitment and that's what uh, I think DDD is, aims, uh, is aiming at uh, doing. So, right. So if we, uh, so <laughs> all these words, I think what I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that uh, uh, if we want to really influence things, we need to have a a true understanding of, of, uh, of the problems. And whose understanding is the most important? Well, this guy, the inventor of uh, event, event storming, has a opinion about this. The assumption of the developers. And now for people who have tried event storming, that's a fantastic uh, technique. You, you have, you know, if you have silos, uh, teams and systems, you put all the people in the, in, in the same room and then you have all of a sudden the business process uh, all as business events, uh, domain events on, on, on a timeline. And I have seen so many times that a developer and the 
business person or a domain expert in DDD lingua come to argue. So in, uh, for instance, in Dance Bank, I have experienced a credit underwriter who said, ever since this system was, uh, 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 went live, I have been specifying all the requirements. I know every single rule in this, uh, in this, in this system, so don't tell me I'm wrong. And then the developer ended up opening the laptop and telling her, you know, uh, this rule is, you know, look at this uh, switch and then there is a if, this, this is, oh, he, it's here. Okay, so that's it. So a lot of the surprises come from, you know, the business person says, thinks that we are really on top of things. But what goes into the production, what faces the customer is the developer's assumption. So we need to improve the understanding of, of the developers. And unfortunately, human communication is really hard. We don't have a hive mind. We don't have a Borg hive mind. We don't have this uh, subspace that uh, you know, connects our collective thoughts and can even you know, evolve tactics uh, 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 when, 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 uh, when we're together. So the, um, uh, unfortunately, the only way we can, uh, we can do communication, human communication, is through language. So if, um, so suppose we can do this, I, I can basically upload what I want to say in the next 40 minutes up to a server and then you can download it without distortion, then we can call off the rest of the talk, right? But that doesn't really happen. So the language of human language is really messy, right? It's confusing. Look at this, JavaScript, not related to Java at all. Strawberries contain no straw. And flammable means exactly the same as inflammable. This is English, right? Uh, what is the plural form of a mouse? The answer is the famous, it depends, right? Are you talking about that animal with the long tail or are you talking about a device with push buttons? Two choices. So that's very, very confusing. A language is also ambiguous, so account can mean you know, uh, three different things in, in, in different contexts. And even in banking, the word account, I just talked with uh, my dear colleague uh, Pizza, uh, uh, the word account in, in core banking and in payment domains have maybe the same data structure, but the business rules governing them, the constraints, the environments are completely different. Imagine the payment account and the checking accounts are you know, coded in the same system. If you're smart, then you have prefix your classes with, you know, payment accounts and then a, 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 a checking accounts. The tricky thing is that in this picture, it's simpler. These, these spaces, the definition of account in these three, pace, three spaces are mutually exclusive. There's no that much confusion, but in payment account and checking account, there is overlap. So we always face the choice. Do we want to consolidate into a shared kernel and then have two bounded contexts, or what do we do with that situation? What I have often seen is a lot of switches, you know, uh, 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 if then else, I have seen a situation if the customer uh, 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 um, onboarded in the online bank banking system, then execute this rule and then otherwise execute that rule. And uh, I've seen SonarCube uh, uh, reports of, uh, you know, uh, uh, modeling logic with the big, you know, high cognitive load, right? It's, it's, <laughs> it's happening everywhere. And that's, and also the um, language can be lost in translation if there is a handoff, you know, from top to down, from down to up, and from, you know, profession to profession, uh, just like children playing the telephone game. And so what DDD really wants to facilitate, wishes to facilitate, is the creation of a co coherent language to drive that understanding. So basically to go to the, the core of the challenge itself, to say if language is the thing that teases us, let's work with language. Let's try to uh, make sure the code language mirrors the business language. Let's make sure the code model never get divorced from the business domain model. So they, they develop in tandem. Um, that is basically the idea about DDD, and you see this word ubiquitous, it's very difficult to pronounce, but it actually just means language has only rigor and consistent meaning in context. And let's be clear about that context, because if we can isolate these, these things, these uh, clouds, these small bounded contexts, then we can 
really improve our code's changeability in the future because we can understand what's happening and if we want to make one change we don't have to touch all parts of the system. And here again my, uh, uh, my proposal or uh, this here is a, again a suggestion about why should we care about DDD. Uh, in my view DDD can really help develop and execute complex change agendas what sort? You, you see there, launching a product line, modernization, cloud migration. Um, you know, I put merging companies there because that's usually where you have similar product domains, but different meanings and implementations. And surviving a crisis like COVID, I've seen a lot of uh, DDD being used to repurpose the existing capabilities. Like you have, you have a physical shop and all of a sudden, you know, you can't go and, and the customer don't come anymore. You have to, you know, repurpose your capabilities and reorg or reteaming uh, Conway's law, reverse Conway's maneuver and all that uh, kind of thing. And how do we do this with DDD? So again, to complete it, DDD helps develop and execute complex change agendas by building a shared understanding through strategic and collaborative design. And that leads to the next portion of, of the talk. Um, it's basically to, to give you this turbo intro of DDD in the next uh, half hour. Um, so I think I will most likely not get the time to talk about the tactical design. So in my, uh, 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 my walkthrough, uh, there will be, I will be covering three core practices in DDD. Uh, on top will be a, a collaborative modeling. That's, you know, that's what uh, 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 the practice is uh, to strengthen collective re reasoning and, uh, and model building for this shared understanding. And collective, collaborative modeling basically is sort of kind of a foundation uh, that also goes into strategic design and tactical DDD, right? For the strategic design, it's, you know, it's quite intuitive. It's about why software, uh, what software are we building? Why are we building it? And tactical design is basically the more technical part, how software is implemented and connected to the other parts. And now, again, we cannot, you know, really say, okay, we only do this or strategic DDD, tactical DDD, things are really interconnected as well. Um, so let's uh, take a look at the collaborative modeling. Uh, so we cannot talk about collaborative modeling without talking about modeling. Modeling is the prerequisite of desi design. So basically, modeling is, is a deliberate act of capturing information, structuring information through abstractions uh, to handle complexity, right? A model needs to have a specific purpose and it's selective about data. So if we uh, take a look at these, this uh, orange uh, shape on the left, um, I could, um, what should I call I could call it a, um, symmetrical three-dimensional uh, shape contained by uh, six equal squares. I could also just call it a cube. Then you can use the rest of your brain capacity to, you know, to process the rest of that model, right? So this is what abstraction is. A lot of people think about abstractions as something to simplify complexity. But if you look at this example, it to call it a cube doesn't really uh, make the reality simpler or more, co more complex. So abstractions is, is, in my eyes, not actually simplifying the reality or the complexity, but make it easier to communicate about that complexity. And so we have this uh, famous quote from uh, George Box, uh, the, the statistician, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, here I've given th uh, the uh, examples of three models. On the left, it's a model of a world, a world map. What is the purpose of that model? Well, basically to see you know, all the names and boundaries of, of the sovereign states in, in the world, right? Talking about abstractions, color, color coding is an abstraction. What is the purpose of the color coding in the world map? Uh, well, it's probably make, to make it easier to see the, uh, the, the boundaries of, of the countries, right? And, you know, does the, does the color have any meaning? Yes and no, right? The, uh, most of it, it's just a, you know, a randomly picked color except for the blue color of the sea. That we can recognize. And what about the size of the countries? Yes or no? Does the size of the country have any meaning? Well, 
I would say again yes and no because here you can see Russia is a lot bigger than Ukraine. I can't even see Ukraine, but, but and even Denmark is too small to be visible on, on the map. So it has some meaning. But if you look at it, Greenland and Africa have the same size. Do Greenland and Africa have the same size? No. No. Greenland is four times the size of Africa. So, but does that era, <laughs> does that era uh, make this world map model a bad model? You decide, right? The purpose of this model, what, what is that? So I leave that to you to decide. The middle model is more real, but is it more useful? The point here is that the effectiveness of a model has nothing to do with how well it represents reality. And the third model here, you can't really see it probably because of the resolution. And this is the Copenhagen Metro uh, map. Uh, so so this, this one has a lot of, uh, 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 this one is very useful to, you know, if you are a commuter it, using public transportation in Copenhagen. But can we use this model to calculate the, the distance between any two stops? Well, we can't. So basically, models have, are very selective about data. And the reason why I'm going through this is because in modeling, we need to be very, very selective about what data to include for what purpose. What we see in the big ball of mud type of architecture is that the purpose is not clear and the data is not selective. And then everything is, is <laughs> uh, mixed together. So we want smaller models that are rigorous, consistent, selective with a clear purpose. Why is it beneficial to model a complex system together, complex stuff together? This is another, you know, you can uh, uh, process this a little bit in your head. The thing is, just like, you know, one, one human constraint we've talked about is that we, we, we've got to communicate through language. This is another constraint. We can only perceive the world through our individual filters. And now look at this example. So these three people come out, out of the same meeting and they say, I'm glad we all agree. That's a magic sentence, right? So the blue person believes that what he has really said okay to is a square. The red person is rather sure that the consensus is about a circle and the yellow person is really, really convinced that uh, they have agreed on a triangle. So with collaborative and visual modeling, what we want to do is to make the implicit explicit. So previously, these these shapes, these assumptions are in these people's head. So what we want to do is to externalize all the assumptions and you know, put them on a blackboard so we can have a conversation about it. And so what's hopefully, ha what's hopefully gonna happen next is that they would you know, probably end up having a, a conversation, a, a dialogue, a dialogue about it. So the, uh, you know, the, uh, they, they can come forward to, you know, the best solution for this problem is not a, the sum of, you know, a, a square and a circle and a triangle, but a different shape. They can, through, you know, a conversation, come forward to other more optimal solutions. And they say, oh yeah, so that's, that's the power of collect, uh, collaborative modeling. So now, when I'm talking about this theoretically, it sounds so obvious, but this is so hard to do. How many people have actually seen this happen? What I've seen mostly happening is that either the end of that, if this is, has been a decision-making meeting, the end of the meeting, so the result of that meeting would either be a juxtaposed square, circle, and triangle, nobody touch, touch them, it's a sum, or there will be a heated debate, either the square me wins or the circle means wins or, or the triangle wins after some voting maybe. So this is, this is actually really hard. This actually requires some magic, right? So that blue person has got to be able to stand in the red person's shoes and actually be able to see that circle the red person sees and embrace the red person's world 100%. In our discussions and meetings, usually, what usually I have facilitated so many meetings, usually if there's a debate whether you know, the, these three solutions, which is better, 
people are really, you know, like sound of silence, you're hearing, people are listening without hearing, right? So, so I listen with the purpose of convince you that my solution is right. So that is really, really a big challenge in, in I mean, also in families, I think. So this, this, uh, there are our tools, uh, there are practices that help us to balance the inquiry with advocacy and try to have this deep listening and deep empathy in our conversations. And that's what collaborative modeling is really about. And when that magic really happens, then we have a better solution that we say, I'm glad we all agree. Um, and so this is also from a different design world. So why do we do collaborative modeling again? So my take is that it, we can understand from different perspectives. We create a shared context and understanding. We help others follow our idea. That's the advocacy part. And then to integrate the collective reasoning and help each other get new ideas, ideas see new connections, and then foster true commitment, right? So that's, uh, this is just an example of uh, one of the workshop series I have facilitated in, in Danske Bank, where we went through all these. And the, what I was talking about, the toughest part is actually there at the cross-domain sessions and business sessions. You see no standard DDD practices here. Here is just one tough conversation after another. One assumption, one friction after another, and you solve them one by one. So in the end, we have commitment and uh, we have an understanding of the, of the problem. So that's, uh, that's about collaborative modeling. Let's uh, quickly go through uh, uh, strategic design because I promised you a turbo tour. The tour will continue from here. I see that you are deeply concentrating either it's completely boring or it's really exciting. So uh, I choose to follow the second assumption and uh, <laughs> don't look at you in the eyes for now. <laughs> strategic design is also called domain-driven architecture. So uh, that's my, almost the talk of my, my, uh, my last DDDU talk. So today, so, the, so I'm, I'm an architect, so the, uh, the color coding is that the, the yellow, yellowish stickies would be the core DDD practices, the DDD original, and then it's been cross-pollinated by, by those uh, white ones, right? So today I can barely touch, you know, barely scratch the surface for the first four. I hope you bear with me. Uh, with this, within this uh, one hour. <laughs> uh, so it's about domain boundaries, subdomain types, ubiquitous language, and bounded contexts. Right. And so being str so strategic DDD it really is about, you know, separating the problem space and solution space. Not only that, but involving the people who are usually working with the solution space, invite them to be part of the problem space. So we've got to model the problem space to understand, and we model the solution space to make an impact. It always starts here. But then in our corporate world, 2023, what usually happens is kind of, we say we don't do waterfall anymore, but we do. Because the problem space belongs to the strategy floor, the you know, people who are actually idealizing and making those really, really big decisions, and when it hits the teams, it becomes, you know, a feature statement or an epic. The teams still are not in, really involved in the problem space. And why I'm saying this is because the problem can really only be deeply understood in the process of exploring its solution space. And nothing can illustrate this better. So the problem space includes those things, right? To understand user needs and customer needs and solution space and the, about the solution practices. So there are two pieces of design of furniture there. So in Denmark, we are actually really good at merging, at least in this domain, the furniture domain, really good at merging the, the problem space and the solution space. Uh, in a lot of the furniture studios, it's, it's the artist and the designer sitting together with the carpenters. And so rapid prototyping, the problem, well, the, the biggest gain is not that the designer can actually see what the carpenter works out, so they will see it eventually. The thing is the carpenter participates in the design process in a different way than if he has received um, a drawing from the designer and say, okay, this is the chair, let's 
let me just make it, right? So, so that's an interactive process. Um, let me ask you this question. What should engineering teams expect from their product managers or product owners or project managers? Should they be telling a compelling story about why this product or feature matters in a bigger context? Or should they clarify, you know, in our refinements meetings, what the scope and priority is for this feature? I think, unfortunately, the right side is still, um, you know, the, uh, the predominant case. Um, and that basically cuts off the developers, the, the business an analysts, the teams from participating in that larger problem, problem context. And this is a survey, a uh, yearly survey. Unfortunately, I only got the data from 2020. Uh, in the, uh, actually, this is uh, in the United States of America, where they interview a lot of product managers and product owners. And this is really quite surprising, right? And they are asked, you know, what's, what, what is the source of best products and feature ideas? First one is always the customer. The second one, look at here, it's team brainstorming. And executive orders is further down, sales team is further down, right? So it's, it's actually teams that have the best uh, uh, ideas, so 57%. Mm -hmm. um, so what is empowerment? Empowerment is such a buzzword in the corporate space. We, we are being empowered all the time. Uh, so the real empowerment of engineering teams is to really give them to that you provide them with the problem to solve and the strategic context the why it sounds so obvious but it's so not being done and marty kagan is a technology product uh, uh, thinking uh, um, a thought leader so he wrote this book empower and a whole book just to make this point um right so the last part uh, of the walkthrough will be basically about you know, these really nasty concepts about domains and con context. Domains, domains live, sorry, domains <laughs> live, live in, the, in the problem space. So the domain language is messy, is fluid, is natural, ambiguous when we come to the bounded context, when we start modeling with the solution space, the bounded context starts to be, needs a domain model, a ubiquitous language that is rigorous, unambiguous, and consistent, right? So that's, that's how it is. Um, the, uh, if we look at the solution space in DDD, this is sort of a, a, a meta model, right? Uh, the ubiquitous language is, uh, you know, something we, speak all the time in conversations, in documentation, in tests, and then that is protected by bounded contexts because it's impossible to make a universal enterprise uh, ubiquitous language without all those confusing you know, prefixes nor if then else, right? We've, done, we've tried that in, also in Danske Bank, we didn't succeed. And then uh, the uh, bounded context is then implemented as a domain model, which is actually a tactical pattern. So really, one thing we need to be mindful of, again, ubiquitous doesn't mean ubiquitous across the enterprise, and there is also no enterprise domain model to rule them all. And, and that's, uh, that's a misconception I've hear, heard time after time about what, what ubiquitous language is. What is the scope of ubiquitous language? What is the scope of a domain model? It's never the enterprise. Um, then, so, so this, is, this is the solution space, right? And you know, basically mm, sandwich the uh, the uh, problem space into it. Then we have the strategized part with the subdomain strategies. So DDD distinguishes between three types of uh, subdomains: core subdomain, supporting subdomain, and generic subdomain. Core subdomain, that's where you know, a, a, your company has a competitive advantage. It's a source of competitive advantage, either in the form of uh, uh, innovation or in the form of, you know, uh, uh, optimizing processes, banks, for instance, right? Uh, then uh, the, the uh, supporting domains is, is uh, you are not really having a, a, a competitive advantage uh, out of it, but, you know, it's, uh, it, you, can, you also cannot buy it. So you've got to do it yourself. It's a supporting subdomain and generic subdomains, basically everybody does it the same way and then you can basically buy uh, instead of build. And this is the, the basically the three subdomain types. 
And the reason why we want to do this in DDD is actually to guide our resource deployment. If it is a core domain, we need to we are justified we, we are justified in using more complex and time consuming implementation patterns such as the domain model and the event sourcing and CQRIs and, and so forth. If it's a supporting subdomain, an example could be you know a product catalog or a customer system. Uh, we can buy them probably existing, but that would be too much customizing. So, but then it, the uh, the logic we want to make sure that the supporting subdomain doesn't have complexity, too much complexity. So we can use the active record or transaction script pattern to so active record is basically the CRUD pattern. Transaction script is basically you do a SQL script in, in your code and sort of thing. It's more nuanced than that, but that's basically <laughs> um, in a turbo talk, that would be it. The general a generic subdomain would be a, a sort of like a HR system, a CRM system, people buy it. And now I have a question uh, for, for you guys. So, talk, okay, so actually this is also another way of visualizing this. This approach is called core domain chart. It plots the business differentiation on one axis, on the X axis, and then the business logic complexity on the Y axis. So this is, this is so. So let me ask you, so think about Google. <coughs> Google's money. Um, you know, profits come mostly from the, uh, you know, the, the Google ad advertising platform and the Google Cloud platform. If I ask you, what about the Google domain um, search and ranking algorithm domain? Is that a core domain? Who thinks it's a yes? Who think it's not? Uh-huh. It's almost 50-50, and uh, so it's actually a core domain. Core domain doesn't really have, uh, a d um, so if you're making money or not out of your cor core domain is not part of the definition. Without uh, ranking and uh, search algorithms, Google would make no money from their ads, so it's actually uh, differentiating. What about a second example, uh, maybe a, um, Think about a jewelry designer. Now we're th thinking about you know confirmation uh, gifts for our neighbor. Uh, a jewelry designer with a web shop. What is the core domain of a jewelry designer? The the web shop is that a core domain? No, I think we can probably agree, right? The core domain of that jewelry designer is actually the handcraft. So a core domain doesn't have to be software based. Uh, again, so this is again uh, uh, some of the nuances in, in subdomains. Um, yeah, uh, again, the uh, uh, we uh, bounded contexts are not microservices, so it has physical boundaries. It can be, you know, one bounded context can be implemented as a strategic monolith, or it can be implemented. The same bounded context can be imp implemented as small microservices, right? So basically, it, it, think about bounded context as the largest physical boundaries of the, you know, the, the biggest physical service possible. Why? Because that's, that's where you don't have any conf conflicting models. If you know the domain very little, try to start with the large granular um, uh, 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 physical boundary because it's much easier to extract physical services out of a, 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 out of a large context than if you have already had m microservices and you found out the b boundaries are wrong, you need to refactor, right? Um, and here we have, uh, I think I only have time to walk through this example and then we will close down. The business domains, uh, this is basically to give you a story to, to big, bring home the point of uh, what is a domain bounded context. So imagine this company start, starting having, uh, by having a sales system, and, uh, one sales system, one sales domain, uh, one sales bounded context with two entities, lead and campaign. So gradually, the language starts to conflict with each other. So when this company does marketing, lead is, so campaign would be you know, a, a process, a, a, a complex entity. 
But campaign in the sales context is basically a data structure cap capturing you know, the current state of, of the campaign, right? And for lead, it's, it's, it's kind, kind of the opposite. Lead is an uh, event in the marketing context. So some, some customers have really be in, been uh, positive about the campaign. It has provided customer contact information. And then uh, the, the, uh, the lead would then go into the sales context as a complex entity. So at this point, the company decides to separate out the big sales context into a marketing context and a sales context to avoid conflicting languages. So it could be a startup, right, at this, at this stage, right? Uh, the, uh, uh, mm, it could be just two people working from a garage. Then as the complexity of, this, of, of the business uh, uh, progresses, we would have two subdomains as well. So compare these two pictures. So the, the, the sales subdomains come into being, usually that because, that's because, exactly because the business gets more complex and, and the processes, uh, more processes are introduced. So you have then marketing uh, campaign managers and sales managers in different roles. Eventually, the sales subdomain would then become a, a, a more complex, uh, evolving into the CRM context, product context, and bidding context, right? So uh, because it's so well isolated, it can you know, be developed really, really uh, 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 fast. And then eventually, uh, people can you know, strategize by saying, OK, we have a CRM. That's a generic subdomain. We have a billing system. We don't want to buy somebody else's in order to avoid customization, so we have a supporting domain there. And then we want to keep our product domain as our core. So that is basically a, a choice that would make these uh, 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 three new subdomains. Uh, and then eventually that could be matched with the team boundary to say, OK, to you know, uh, distribute the cognitive load, team A can be in charge of the generic and supporting subdomains because they're not so complex. And we ask team B to focus on the core domain. So business can you know, evolve like this and then work with these concepts, DDD concepts like this. Tactical design, I have no time to walk you through these anymore, maybe at a different session. Let's close down um, of the summary. Um, we have seen this already, so let's, uh, let's, let's uh, start here, just a couple of slides to close. If you're a leader, the message from DDD is to lead with the why, not the way. What if you are not a leader? Peter Block says, how do you change the world? One room at a time. Which room? The one you are in. If we can all start by having those ubiquitous attention to language in all our conversations, in all the meeting rooms, I think we're making a difference. What's DDD for me personally? If I really reflected, DDD has provided me with a way to connect with myself and others on what's important in my work with design. It's given me the opportunity to be connecting with what I'm really passionate about doing and having that deep alignment with both the, mostly it's with the people and facilitating a talk that is actually a dialogue, not just a discussion. You know, dialogue is from the Greek word dialogos, so it's a flow of meaning and not just try to convince each other. And finally, I'd like to close with a challenge to you. So in the 12th century, Archimedes said, give me a place to stand and a lever, then I can move the world. In your context, what's one leverage you can think of that you might influence with the help of DDD? With that, thank you very much. Thank you.